Hey everyone, this is Baphometrics, and today I'm going to show you a few tricks and gotchas about the note counter modulator in Bitwig. And I'm going to do that in conjunction with a real world example of converting a fairly nuanced acoustic drum loop into a MIDI version of that same drum loop that you could uh, modify and play with. So let's. Uh, start out by showing you what the original drum loop sounds like. So we're only hearing this one green clip right now. Okay, and what you'll notice about that, if you listen close, it's a, it's a boogaloo style drum beat. Um, and Boogaloo has a lot of nuance on the articulation of your hits. There's a lot of articulation on the hi-hats, semi-open positions and tighter closed positions. There's some ghost hits on the snare that sometimes are layered with the hi-hat uh, itself. So it's not just a, a, a snare hit on the two and the four, but there's a couple little eighth note ghost hits in between there. Uh, and then the kick itself has a lot of nuanced articulation to it. So listen to this sample one more time and really notice how the kick sounds different with almost every beat. The hats sound different with almost every 16th note. And the snare itself even has some articulation on it. So one more time. Okay, so as a former drummer, when I was a stage musician, I spent many, many years behind the drum kit and did uh, funk and acid jazz and stuff like that. So I'm a big fan of real, realistic articulation in drums. And that's really hard to capture when you set up MIDI drums and um, just use some stock drum samples. You don't get nearly a, a very realistic human articulation which in a lot of EDM music you actually kind of don't want, but if you're making hip hop or you're making more, if you're trying to inject a, a kind of trippy 70s uh, breakbeat or boogaloo feel into a song, you're gonna want that realistic articulation. So uh, this drum loop looks fairly simple. There's just some kick and snare and hat hits and uh, yet, what I've done here is effectively chopped up this loop in a way and um, played some tricks with note counter and multi samples to help this MIDI drum sound almost exactly like the original drum loop. So I'm going to toggle back and forth between them with um, solo and you can hear for yourself the difference. We'll start with the original drum loop and I guess before I do that, let me go in and reset all the note counters on these various things. Hey, if any Bitwig developers are watching this video, I really, 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 really want you to put some sort of uh, configuration value inside of note counter, some sort of user selectable option to somehow start from zero with the transport so that if I stop the transport and restart the transport, I have an option to always make sure the note counter starts over from zero because right now it doesn't do that and I hate that because it means if I want to get a predictable take for a use case like I'm about to demonstrate in this video, I need to come in here and manually click reset on every single note counter <laughs> so that it's going to start from zero when I start you know, my entire arrangement playback. And that's really annoying and really slow. If I mess up, uh, I'm not going to get the exact results I want every time I play something. In some use cases for note counter, it doesn't matter because you just want it to randomize things. But in this use case, I think I'll, I'll be able to demonstrate why I would want this to start from zero each time uh, I stop and restart the transport. So anyway, um, I'm going to start with the original uh, drum sample and then flip back and forth between the original sample and just the MIDI drums. And while I'm doing that, let me go back to the kick here. 
watch how every time the kick hits or every time the hat hits or every time the snare hits when I'm showing the uh, when you're listening to the MIDI drums watch how over here it's cycling through the samples in in a sequential order so we'll start off here with the acoustic and then you'll just watch me flipping back and forth and I'll stay quiet so you can listen closely to the difference yourself Okay, so that's probably enough. And you can hear they're nearly identical. I mean, yeah, because of the way samples are chopped and everything, you don't quite have the true ring out of certain drum hits tailing into the next drum hit, but it's really, really close. So I'm gonna show you how I built this, um, uh, the general technique for it. And I'll also explain a few things about using the note counter mod on the way, because this is a pretty confusing modulator at first until you think about it really hard and experiment with a few things. So uh, let's start with just the audio sample. There's nothing fancy about it. It's an analog drum recording. Uh, you can tell by looking at the transients against the beat grid that, of course, this drummer is playing with a very human timing. Uh, and they're doing a 16th note hi-hat pattern. Uh, these are the snare hits, these denser looking ones, but I can guarantee you that over some of the hi-hats, he's also doing ghost hits on the snare. Um, so if we were to chop the sample up and try to turn it into a drum rack, you know, we basically want to capture each one of these 16th note segments is pretty close to the mark, right? But since they're not directly on the grid, we really want to chop it up and capture them at the onsets of each note and then play some games after that. So I'm going to just walk you through the process. Hopefully you'll learn a few things from, from watching this and uh, I'll, I'll talk some things out as I go. So we're going to start with the original audio. And uh, the first thing we need to do is capture the, well, first we need to figure out what tempo it's in. So this is the original sample, and the way that I figured out the tempo to work in for this project is uh, if you go over here into your Files tab of the project, once you've dragged in a certain sample from somewhere that you're trying to do this to, uh, you just need to double click on it and see what the event is called. That's the sample name. So this is Drums84 Kickboxer. That's this particular sample right here. So the easiest thing to do is to go to Serato Sample. If you have Serato Sample, great. If you don't have it, I cannot recommend this plugin enough. It is so useful for so many use cases, but what I use it for in almost every project is just to figure out the key and tempo of samples really quickly and easily instead of beating my head against trying to like match it up to a grid visually or listen to it and figure out the key by ear, it's just a pain in the butt. So one of the nice things about Serato Sample is I can just take this sample, drag it right in and drop it, and instantly Serato tells me it's at 84, and this loop, you know, even though it's a drum loop, there's still some tonality to the kick and the snare, and so this drum loop's in F minor. And that's not metadata that's in the sample file. This is Serato figuring it out, and it's wonderful at that. It's super freaking accurate. Okay. So 
the main thing I wanted for this clip is what tempo am I working at uh, so that I can uh, maybe reset the tempo and redrag in the drum loop uh, at the right tempo so that it's not stretched weirdly in any way or, or whatever. I want it to line up with the beat grid correctly. So once you, you know, reset your tempo to match a sample, you can just drag in the sample. And if you look at it, you should see the grid lining up more or less correctly with the transients, uh, given the humanization of the original loop here. Uh, and so that's the first thing we want, because we're going to need this to be close to the grid and at the right tempo for the slicing operation to uh, get out the kind of multi-samples we want from it. Now, bef before I do the multi-samples uh, and, and get those set up, I'm going to show you how to get the MIDI out of this. So here's the MIDI clip. And how did I get this? Because unfortunately, Bitwig by itself doesn't natively help you create this. And it's very difficult to sort of eyeball this and set up a MIDI loop to match. I mean, some of us are maybe more adept at that than others, but it's really hard, even when you're zooming in a lot and looking closely at where the transients start. It's just, and even with Bitwig's great features for layering an audio sample behind the MIDI, it's just really slow to try and line up your MIDI notes with the exact onsets of every single hit when they're humanized and they're not on the grid, right? If you're doing this by eyeball, it just takes forever. So this is where Ableton still has a really strong advantage over Bitwig. And it's one of the reasons I can't uh, bring myself to get rid of Ableton entirely because I use it all the time for this specific use case. And so again, if there's any Bitwig developers watching this, you really, 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 really need to give us the equivalent of uh, their conversion to MIDI. Whoops, wrong thing. Sorry about that. Let me close uh, Discord down. Um, so let's show you what's going on here. I want to take this sample and we're going to right click on it over here and just do reveal file to find it in your native file system explorer. So there's where the sample itself lives. We're going to flip over to Ableton, get that finder window back up, and we're going to drag this uh, sample loop into Ableton. And then let's zoom in on that. Ableton, zoom in. There we go. Okay, so there's the clip in Ableton, and as always, Ableton is not friendly about lining up the grid. Okay, so Ableton has this great set of features called convert harmony to MIDI, convert melody to MIDI, and convert drums to MIDI. Oh, do I wish Bitwig had these native inside it. If Bitwig ever comes up with their own version of this, I am done with Ableton. I will never need to go back to Ableton for anything. But for now, this is still a critical use case for a typical producer, I think. Um, so, you know, we take the sample, we put it in Ableton, we do convert drums to new MIDI track. And wait for Ableton. So Ableton's kind of stupid about this in terms of the drums itself. It puts it in this default drum track with terrible samples in it. It's just awful. Um, all we really care about though is the MIDI, which we can't see because Ableton is not friendly about this kind of stuff. But if we drag the track out, there's the MIDI. And you know, your mileage may vary depending on how noisy the sample is or how busy and cluttered the sample is. In this case, it's a fairly clean sample, so I can already tell visually Ableton did a pretty good job of lining up the transients uh, and, and figuring out which notes are what. This is obviously the kick row at the bottom. This is obviously the snare row, and this is the hi-hat row. And we can see that right here we have a doubled up kick and snare, which may or may not be correct. I would have to listen to the original uh, sample at this point right here to, to make sure. Uh, but just from the look of it, you know, when I look at the other kick transients by themselves, and then I look at the denseness of this one spot right here, maybe there's a snare uh, overlaid. God darn you, <laughs> Ableton. There we go. You know, maybe there's a snare transient piled on top of that. Maybe there isn't. 
because that's what a snare looks like in this loop. So I'm guessing that's a, a bad hit, uh, but I'll leave it in for now just for grins because uh, it'll also demonstrate some other useful things I can do in Bitwig to manage this. Uh, I'm guessing that's a bad guess on Ableton's part though. Just, just looking at the transient is pretty obvious to me. Okay, so uh, once you have this MIDI clip, you right click it and do export MIDI clip right here. And that's going to let you put it somewhere. So this is the sort of the parent folder of where I'm doing this video and where I have this project. So I'm just going to put it in this parent folder so it's easy to find. I've already exported it one time, so I won't actually click save here. Uh, but you would just export it out. And now we're done with Ableton. We don't need Ableton anymore. Goodbye. No, go away. So I find myself occasionally firing up Ableton just to do this kind of thing right here. Uh, Bitwig, save me that trouble, add those features, please. Okay, so uh, over in Bitwig, you can then drag in that MIDI file from your folder. So if we go find where I saved it, it's right here. And if I were to drag this in to just some new spare clip, there we go, done, easy peasy. So now we have a MIDI clip uh, from the original drum sample. Um, I'm gonna get rid of these two things now because we don't need them. We'll just work on, oops, stop that. Uh, we'll just work on the originals I had. Okay, so here's the MIDI clip. Again, this one little snare hit right here might be um, unnecessary. Uh, but I'm gonna leave it in for now, just to kind of show you how to deal with this uh, in a graceful way. If you're not sure whether you should keep a potentially a bad MIDI choice like that or not. Okay, so the trick is every one of these kicks is a slightly different kick sound. Every one of these snares is a slightly different snare sound. Every one of these hi-hats is definitely a different hi-hat sound. Uh, and so we figure that out and we make those sounds by uh, effectively taking the original drum loop, right clicking it and using slice to multi sample, not drum machine, multi sample. And I'm going to stop for a second and show you why you don't want to use drum machine. So I'm going to slice this out to drum machine. Uh, and we're going to say, go ahead and slice it at the onsets and it's going to make 32 different slices and it's gonna plop it into a drum machine. And I recommend when you're doing stuff like this, always work in 32-bit floating point so you're not dealing with uh, down uh, bit truncation and, and truncation distortion like I talk about in one of my other videos. Uh, you can read all about that stuff in this one here called Dithering Gotchas. If you don't understand why I'm giving you that advice, number 10 in my series. Um, so we're gonna slice out here to a drum machine. So it creates a new track. It's a drum machine track with a bunch of drum names that are just completely useless because they're all just the name of the sample itself. And uh, it gives us a MIDI clip that just walks in stair-step order through all 20, 32 samples. And it's also kind of, you know, it's broken at the onset. So you're seeing where all the onsets are actually kind of hitting that it detected in the original sample. If you look at the original sample, there's 32 of these little blue markers, which are the onset markers. And some of them are in kind of bad places. If I zoom in right here, you can see that's probably a spurious onset. It's not part of any real uh, cymbal hit. Like this is clearly a cymbal hit or a hi-hat hit. And that little thing right there, that onset is just the last part of that cymbal hit before the next cymbal hit right here. So there's a couple bad onsets in here and that's okay. I don't believe you have to get really um, anal retentive about cleaning up your onsets before doing slicing. You could if you want to, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes you're just in a hurry and you want results that are close enough. 
And I'm going to show you how to deal with that's a bad onset there and that's a bad onset right there. Those two little ones really, really close together. What you'd ideally want to see are onsets at roughly every 16th note going across the grid. Maybe a missing onset for really long hits that don't have a, a, an accompanying hi-hat hit underneath them, like this big snare right here doesn't have any other hit happening right here. Or maybe it does, but because the snare hit was so loud and powerful, it's obscuring the onset of maybe an underlying hi-hat right here. But, you know, you'll get the hang of reading these onsets. Uh, anyway, so back to what the drum machine does is it, it creates something that's kind of useful, but not useful in the context of MIDI. Because how do you arrange these 32 MIDI notes into a usable, reasonable drum pattern when every one of these notes represents a different sound in the drum kit. So here's a kick sound right here. Uh, have I got... Oh, yeah, you're on, but I need to solo you. I'm gonna do... Turn that off for a sec. Okay. Let's turn that down a little so I don't blow your ears out too much. Should be about right. So there's one kick. That's a um, uh, hi-hat. Another kick. There's our first snare. Another kick. Hi-hat. That's one of those rim shot. That's like a light rim tap. Um, boogaloo ghost note on the snare plus a hi-hat. A little bit of a rim shot there, but I'm just gonna call that a hi-hat because it's a ghost note. That's definitely a hi-hat. Kick. Another hi-hat. This thing here is one of those spurious transients. Doesn't even sound like anything. Kick. Snare. Another tiny, tiny little tap transient on a hi-hat, but probably it's really these two are just one hi-hat hit together. Uh, and so on. So anyway, it's very hard to turn this extraction into a usable drum pattern because what you want to have is what we see here, which is all the kick hits on one row together. So you can see the timing and you can just know that they're kick hits. Uh, and as if I zoom in a little bit, you can see that most of these are off grid, right? This kick is a little late compared to the grid. Uh, the snare is a little bit later than the kick. The hi-hat is kind of in line with the kick, but there's probably a subtle difference. Uh, and as we scroll through here, you know, you can just see that it's a very humanized timing. Like that hi-hat's right on, hi-hat hit is right on grid, but this one isn't. This one isn't. Uh, here, the kick is right on grid, but the hi-hat's slightly delayed. We zoom in really, really close. Oh, no, I guess the hi-hat's on grid, too. Um, but the point is you want humanized timing, so you don't want to ever mess with quantizing these notes, but you do want to have a sense of, I can see my kicks, I can see my snares, I can see my hi-hats, I know what each hit is, and you cannot create that from starting from this sliced drum machine. It's just next to impossible because every one of these kicks would have to be on a different note in order to trigger all the different sounding kicks. And we're going to fix that uh, by instead putting all the kicks on the same exact note, but using a multi-sample for every one of those different kick slices. So let's show you how we build that. Let's get rid of the drum machine and let's do it the right way. So you're going to start by taking your original loop, right click, do slice to multi-sample, because all we want to do is get those 32 slices out of the, uh, the original loop. So we're going to grab it. It's a two bar loop. It's basically a 16th note drum pattern. So 16 times two is 32. So we want all 32 16th notes effectively from the, the kit. And I could have sliced it I could have said slice it by, um, instead of onset, you could choose 16th note and it will create, see this is the problem. 
there's uh, one extra thing in there that would create 33 slices, and it's because of the humanized timing of things. Some things are not occurring exactly on the 16th notes. There's probably a little bit of a tail at the end of this. I don't know. Let's bounce it out and see what it looks like anyway. So this is the slice that was made according to 16th notes. And if we look at the way it lines up, why do we have 33 of these? It looks like a simple two bar pattern. So this could be a good way to go. Um, let's actually look at each of the individual slices under the microscope by going to the sampler itself, blowing it up. Uh, let's zoom in a little bit by putting your cursor anywhere up in this area, holding control and scrolling your wheel to make it a little easier to see the key range and actually click the keys for each sound. There's a kick. Oops, let me turn this down real quick. Minimize this for a sec. Let's turn both of these down about 10 dB, roughly. Okay, so let's go back in here and take a look again. Uh, we're in this track, this sampler. Zoom in again. And you can scroll back and forth with your Alt key. Uh, it's a very friendly thing. So here's the kick. And let's actually select one of these, well, select the wave here or here, either way, to see what the kick looks like. And we can actually, again, hold Control or just click and drag to see the kick itself. So sure enough, that looks like it could be the end of the kick. Uh, that's a 16th note. This next note here, I click it. That's just a hi-hat. If we zoom in, we can see something's going on. It's probably just a hat. Uh, this next one here, whoops, this one. It's a little fiddly. <laughs> God damn it. Sometimes it's a little fiddly to, fiddly to figure out where to click here. I find it's usually on the left side of each one of these little blocks is the good place to kick, click. If I click over here, it's going to actually, you know, it's like there's an invisible center point down each bar. Um, so click on the left side and you'll have a better look at triggering these things. That's clearly a hi-hat hit. And again, we can zoom in to look at that. But here's what I want to show you. So this hi-hat, when we sliced at exact 16th notes according to the grid, because of our humanized timing and the fact that this kick isn't really happening on the grid, this is like a hi-hat and here's another kick right after it here. The, the hi-hat's getting chopped short a little bit. It's not ringing out for its full, its full span before the kick hits. And if I go select the kick and we zoom in there, you're gonna see that because we sliced exactly to a 16th note grid and because this kick is late, it's humanized, it's not hitting right on the grid. We have this empty space in front of the actual kick transient, which starts right about here, okay? So this is why you typically don't wanna slice to 16th notes or eighth notes when you're uh, trying to convert a human analog organic drum loop into MIDI because you're gonna get these strange gappy wrong positions for all of your samples because they're not directly on the grid like a machine would do. So let's look at these same samples but in the version that we sliced out by onset. So this was the this track was the one that we sliced by 16th note. This is the track we sliced by onset. And if we go look at the sampler here and examine those first few notes, zoom in a lot. So here's our first kick. And if we look at the sample, um, we can see that it's, you know, started right at the onset of the kick over here. We look at the next one, hi-hat hit. Zoom in, we can see that this hi-hat is starting right where the transient onset of the hi-hat is, and it rings out all the way until right up at the next kick, right next to it. So this is perfect, right? And if we go listen to this kick, and we look at the actual sample and zoom in, scroll it over, 
you can see this kick is perfect. It's, it starts right at the onset of the kick. It ends right at the onset of the next uh, hit, whatever it is. A snare. So this is a snare hit right here. So see, this is why you want to slice by onset. And if you really want to be anal retentive, there are a few onsets in here that aren't uh, they're bad onsets. You could clean up the onsets first, but I don't think it's a big deal, and I'll show you why. I just fix it while I'm doing the next phase of this whole process, and I'll show you how I fix it. So we've got this full multi-sample that is every little hit captured in its own perfectly done, almost perfectly done slice, with the exception of some of those bad onsets. But most of these are rock solid, perfectly lined up just like I've showed you in these first few hits. So this is what we're going to use as our starting point to make. If you look over here, I made a multi-sample just of the hat and the hat and snare together hits, what I'm considering basically the hat pattern. And then I made another multi-sample of just the kicks and another multi-sample of just the snares. And they were all built from this full multi-sample. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do before we do anything else is We've got this original sliced multi-sample, and we want to save it so we can go back to it and start over with it e at each step of the process. So you click Save up in this corner here, and you can give it a name uh, and whatever information you want. So in this case, that's this one here called, um, let's make this a little bigger. Oh, I actually didn't save it in this project, so let's go ahead and do it. I'll save it in here. Well, no, it's in my browser. <laughs> uh, I saved it to my own multi-sample collections because it's made by me. It just automatically shows up in my collection. Down here, I saved this multi-sample as something I just called Kickboxer Full. That means it's the full set of samples. And then from this Kickboxer Full multi-sample, I made the other three multi-samples. So this is our starting point. So now, Let's pretend we're going to make the, um, we're going to pick out just the kicks and remove everything else and make a multi-sample full of kicks only. So the way we do that is we start at the beginning and we find the first thing that sounds like a kick. Well, that's certainly a kick, right? And we check the next sample. That's not a kick. So I'm just going to select it and press delete. That multi-sample is gone. Check the next sample. That's a kick, so I keep that. Not a kick, so I delete that. That's a kick. Not a kick. Not a kick. That's a kick. Not a kick. Not a kick. That's one of the, the bad transients. There's like no sound on it at all, hardly. So we're just going to get rid of that. And before I go any further, well, no, never mind. <laughs> That's a kick. Let's scroll over a little bit. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Kick. Delete. Delete. It's a kick. Delete. It's a kick. As you can tell, Funk and Boogaloo styles have lots of kick notes. Delete. Okay, so all we're left with are the kick samples. And so now I'm going to give myself a little room to see and work and zoom in to whatever's comfortable for me. And now we just want to stack them one on top of another, but, <laughs> and here's the important but, we want to stack them starting at C0. Right now they're starting on C1. That's where Bitwig's slice to multi-sample will root 
the pattern or root all the samples. It's where it'll start the slices. It starts it on C1 by default. As long as the total number of slices is less than like uh, 89 or 82 or something. Let's go over to the my Bitwig guide for a minute and let me explain a little bit about why I want to move all these down to C0. I'm going to do it first and then I'll explain why and, and point out where in the book it tells you to do that. So we're going to move that one to C0. We're going to stack the next one right next to it. Put the next one right next to that. And as you can see in the diagram below, we're just putting the kicks right next to each other, uh, one semitone apart, which is exactly what we want for a drum kit. And I'll be able to explain all that in a minute. Let's see if I got them all. Nope, there's two more. Okay, so there's all our kicks starting at C0, piled on top of each other, one semitone apart. And again, if we look at the full grid, you don't have to worry about the fact that the original root notes were different. Don't, don't worry about any of that because uh, key follow isn't on and each sample is only one key wide. I'm sorry, key tracking isn't on and each sample is only one note wide anyway, so it wouldn't matter whether this was on or off for each sample. Don't worry about these root notes because it's what they were originally captured at, so they're still in the same perfect tune. And the velocity range is full, as you can see over here, and the selector range is also full. We're not going to play games with uh, the selector because this is a rhythmic 128. Now, let's explain why we put all these on C0 to start with. To understand that, you have to have watched one of my previous videos, number eight in the series, called Making 128s in Bitwig versus Ableton. You have to understand the notion of 128s, rhythmic 128s versus melodic 128s, and why you'd even want to use them in the first place. So if the stuff I'm about to say is a little confusing to you, go back here and watch this video and it'll start making more sense. Also, uh, as with all of my uh, videos in this series of Bitwig versus Ableton, um, I have this accompanying Bitwig handbook. It'll be in the link to the uh, it'll be a link to this will be in the comments for the video. Uh, but specifically in here, if you go to the section on making 128s, I talk a little bit about what is rhythmic 128 versus melodic 128. But more importantly, I want you to look at this drum rack section and specifically how to create a drum pad 97. So we're going to hop down to this section real quick. And what I'm about to talk you through is completely described here, especially how to build something called a drum pad 97 to use in a drum machine the way I'm about to show you. So here's those, you know, the actual written steps for doing it. It's a little complex the first time you do it, but once you wrap your head around it, it's pretty simple and you can build a preset that makes this like completely idiot proof and painless. Um, and I also have a link to that uh, video number eight in my series, but starting at a very specific timestamp that talks and shows you specifically how we build this drum pad. So you can see it visually in a video or you can read about it here either way. And it'll explain all the stuff I'm about to kind of recap quickly. I'm not going to go into as much detail here as I did in that video. So the basic idea for setting up a, a your multi samples for use in a drum machine, why you want to root them on C0 has to do with uh, uh, the way that Ableton's note pitch shifter works. Now, before I do that, I've, I've chopped out the kicks. I've stacked them on top of each other, starting at C0. And before I do anything else, I want to click Save. And here, I would save this with a name like, you know, blah, 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 kicks only. And that is essentially what I've done right here with this kickboxer kicks multi-sample that I'm selecting right here. It's just the kicks chopped out of a boogaloo drum loop uh, from, from this thing. So for example, if I uh, delete this multi-sample entirely and clear it, where the hell is my clear button? 
There we go. So multi sample's gone. If I drag my kickboxer kicks multi sample in here, you'll see it's the exact same thing I just showed you how to set up. Got to zoom in a little bit to let you hear the different kicks. So here's what the different kicks sound like. Hear how they're all so different in their timbre and transient and sharpness and, and fuzziness. And that's what a human kick, a human drummer does with their kick is they articulate it, right? Just like we articulate anything. Uh, same exact drum, same exact recording, same exact loop, different kicks. Uh, so this is how you chop them out and actually get that feel. So, you know, I'm not going to show you how I did it for the hats, but it's the same process. You would load in, you would just drag your kickboxer full in here, start from here, zoom in, find all the hats this time. So we'll get rid of this kick, delete. That's a hat, we'll keep it. Kick, we'll get rid of that. That's a snare, we'll get rid of that. Kick, we'll get rid of that. That's a hat. Okay, now that is one of those ghost hits of a snare and a hat at the same time. He's just very lightly tapping kind of near the rim, getting a little bit of a, a tiny quiet rim shot in there at the same time he's hitting the hat. So I'm gonna keep this as a hat. I'm going to call that a hat, right? That's a hat. Get rid of the kick. And so you would just go through here like this. Uh, I do want to find, I'm going to keep going until I find one of those bad transients. There's a bad transient right after this first snare hit. Or, I'm sorry, a hi-hat hit. So if we click this slice, you're going to see, you're going to see that it, this next sample, which is the bad onset, is just capturing this little section right here before the next kick. So if I click this, see how it's just this tiny little segment right after the previous hat? So there's the hat hit. Here's the bad section right after the hat hit right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop this out because it's a bad onset. But then I'm going to go back to this one and I'm just going to extend it right up to the start of the kick drum. And because I have snap to uh, zero crossing on it with this button over here, I know I can just tell even at this zoom I'm in the right spot. But if I wanted to be really careful, I could zoom in a little further and make sure that I'm really at the start of that uh, next kick drum hit. So I've fixed this note to be a little bit longer to cover the span by that bad onset, okay? And that's the technique for dealing with onsets while you're going through and prepping a multi-sample like this, is just pay attention to what's going on down here, understand what each new slice is telling you, and make sure you're in the right spot, right? So I could literally just walk through here visually, and at some point I'm going to find a really tiny little slice there. That's another bad onset right there. So if I zoom in, and we listen to this, see how it's just a little pop? And the real, it's really part of this thing just before it, which is this. There's a hi-hat hit. Here's the next part of that hi-hat hit. Here's the next hit after that. So what I'm going to do is just go here, and since it's such a tiny part of the previous hi-hat, all I'm going to do here is chop it and not worry about it. There's, there's not much point really in going in here and figuring out exactly where this hi-hat ended. It's probably right here. I can see the zero crossing. So I could snap to there and call it a day, right? Or I could just leave it where it was, because either way, it still sounds like a perfectly good hi-hat. But the point is, find those bad onsets or fix them before you do the slicing. Either way, uh, whatever's an easier workflow for you. So I would go through and chop out everything that wasn't hi-hat, stack them up, and then click save, and save it as a, um, a multi-sample that says this is the hats. Okay, so that's all I'm going to do about this step-by-step -step bit. Let's go back to how to actually use these in a drum kit. 
So you've created multi-samples. They're sitting over here in your user library. They're ready to use. Uh, that we don't need this anymore. We can just get rid of this slice to multi-sample thing. And now we're gonna focus on our MIDI clip. And let me drag this into a new track without, come on you, without any actual sampler on it, okay, or drum machine or anything. So I have my MIDI clip and I wanna make drums that match this. Um, and by the way, a, a nice shortcut in Bitwig is if you double click the original clip, it will zoom to show the entire span of, of notes and show you their note ranges and names a little bit better. I love that feature. But we need to put a drum machine on here. So drum machine. And then here's the trick. You don't wanna just drag these multi samples like they are to oh and let's uh, let's look carefully at the clip and see so C1 D1 and F1 uh, it's just the way I set up this drum machine to actually be able to play it by hand on my push uh, so I I set these notes up to be C1 D1 and F1 which on the drum machine is this square this square and this square so I could use my my thumb middle finger and ring finger to play my drum pattern on, on a push type controller. So we're gonna set up these things the same way. If I just drag kickboxer kicks and drop it onto C1, it's gonna make a sampler with that multi-sample in it. If I drag the kickboxer hats up to F1, it's gonna make that. And if I drag the kickboxer snares over to D1 and drop it, it's gonna do that. So you would think you're done, but you're not done because this actually won't allow me to um, play or select between these things very well. So even though this will play a pattern, it's just gonna play the basically the first slice in each sample. Um, let's do not you, not you, not you. Just close you this way. Let's make sure we're soloed on this one and let's just play it real quick. So you can see the snare is always playing the third one in the, in the sample. Let me turn this down. You can see the snare is always playing only the third snare in the sample. You can see the kick is always playing only the first kick in the multi-sample. And you can see that the hi-hats are always playing only the fifth or sixth hi-hat in the sample right here. So that's not what you want. You wanna rotate through all these in a natural organic way that follow the same order that they appear in the original loop. So to pull this off, we're gonna do two tricks. The first thing we're gonna do is actually build this um, this drum machine out with a type of preset. Again, I'm gonna show you how to build this preset in this section of my guide. So I'm, I pre-create a drum pad 97, I save it as a preset, and then it's ready to just drag into a drum machine. I'll go to a collection of my stuff, and I have this one sampler that's called drum pad 97. Let me drag it onto a drum pad. So we're just going to plop it right here on C1. We're going to also plop it onto F1. And we're going to take it and drag it onto D1. Okay. And they're all identical right now. And every one of them is loaded up by default with a multi-sample of kicks from my, my kick library here. It's just one of these uh, kicks things, right? Kicks A, kicks A. Uh, it's um, loaded up with a default multi-sample, but I'm gonna replace this. So before I do anything else, let's do that. This is my kick pad. So I'm gonna grab my kickboxer kicks and just drag it and drop it onto that sampler. And now it's been replaced with uh, this multi-sample of kicks. These are my hats. So let's find the kickboxer hats, drag it onto the sampler for the hat pad. And then here's my snares, drag the snares onto here, 
And that's how quickly you can set up a drum kit with those multi samples. And now what makes this particular sampler rack uh, different than the first way I showed you, the default obvious way, is there's some extra goodies in here. Uh, this is something that's characteristic of all my drum pads. The first thing that's going on is I have two note devices inside each sampler that are doing a special trick to allow me to use a, let's see if I can make enough room here for everything. Let's close the browser down. Uh, I wanna have a selector knob that will choose which exact sample from potentially an entire uh, multi-sample full of 97 different drum samples. I wanna be able to switch which one is actually playing with a, with a knob. And so that's what the selector knob is. And this is working its magic by using two pitch shifter devices and a, a key tracking modulator that's set up in a very specific way. Uh, and I'm not gonna explain how this works in this video. Go watch that other video about how to create a drum pad 97 to learn why I do this. But the point is, this, is this, this sampler preset is already set up to handle that kind of note management for me and let me use a selector to choose exactly which sample to use. So that's the first thing that's different. Uh, let's go look at the, the kicks. Uh, the, the next thing that's different about my 97 is I like to um, modulate the start point of every sample. So if I were to play this drum kit real quick, let's close this down. This way I've got a few of them open. Uh, let's just play this drum kit for a second. And why am I hearing no sound? Think about this for a minute. Ah, because I haven't dragged the selector knob all the way down yet. Get that all the way down for the kicks. Let's get this all the way down for the snares. Get this all the way down for the, I'm sorry, that was the hats. These are the snares. So now if I play this. Oh, come on, don't make a liar out of me. What am I missing? What am I missing? Something obvious, something simple. Oh, oh, oh. Let's turn it up a little bit, maybe. No, I'm missing something super obvious. Okay, well, it's not important for this. The main thing I wanted to do was trigger the randomizer to start working. Um, so <clears throat> what the randomizer is doing is it's controlled by this knob right here. If I drag it all the way down, there's no randomization happening. And as I turn this knob up more, I get some very widely modulated and very random uh, modulators. And what this modulator is modulating is the offset of each sample that's being played. So if I were to blow this up and we take a look at, uh, for example, this first sample, and we zoom in really, really close on that sample, you can see that this randomizer is modulating in a very small amount the, the start offset in the sampler. That's what this little flippy thing is. That's the nominal start point, but the randomization is making it jump all around in the transient part of the snare. This is where the transient of the snare is happening. And so I can make it jump around a lot or only jump around a tiny, tiny bit, right? And this is affecting the timbre and sound of that snare to give it a further kind of humanization, right? Because only a machine hits perfectly every single time. Humans have different articulation, different places they hit, different angles and attacks. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So this kind of gives the snare a little more of a humanized, lifelike feel, okay? And that's all this thing is for.
So again, I think I tell you how to make all this in that video and my Bitwig guide. But the point is, let's close all this down and let's just get rid of this. I've shown you how to build it. When you're done at the end of the day, you end up with um, this thing that's just gonna play these three samples and it's set up to play any one of these. But now we have to do the third step, which is setting up the note counter modulation to actually cycle through all these in a round robin kind of way. So let's hear it again real quick. Hopefully, oh, I know what's wrong. Aha, it was playing for you. My, my sub pack, my headphones run through my sub pack and my sub pack times out after a while. Uh, if I'm not, if I'm talking for too long without playing any signal, it times out, so I wasn't hearing anything in my headphones. But here's the drums. Okay, so um, what we need to make it do now, you know, we've created the multi samples, we've dropped it in a drum pad 97, and now we just need to set up the note counter device to to cycle through these one by one with each new incoming note. That's what note counter does, is it literally says, all right, every time a new note hits, I'm going to increment by one, and I'm gonna send out some kind of modulator value each time I increment. So if you count up all of the kicks that, that I have in the kick rack, so if we blow this up real quick, and we just select the first kick, and then the last kick by holding shift to multi-select them, we can see we have exactly 10 kick samples. We're gonna do the same thing for the hats here. Uh, let's blow up the hats. Yeah, because I got too many of these things open. <laughs> uh, what do I wanna do with you? Let's do it this way. So these are the hats. If I select, oh, damn you. Nope, not that. Why are you being a pain in the butt? There we go. Um, select the first hat, select the last hat. I have 14 hats. And then finally, I have uh, four snares. So 10 kicks, 14 hats, and four snares. So what we want to do is drop a note counter modulator into each of these racks and it starts at zero so 10 steps would go from zero through nine and that's 10 total right uh the hats there were 14 of them so if we look at what i set up for the hats it's 14 steps from zero through 13 incrementing by one each time and then the snare there were four snares zero to three so we wanted to increment by one each time a new note comes in on each of these channels or each of these uh, MIDI lanes. And then the trick is, well, how do we set the modulator to put out the right kind of value to actually push these through? Let's look at the snare, let's look at the hats first because that happens the most frequently. Okay, so the main thing to know about note counter, and this drove me crazy, uh, what I want to have it do is affect my little trick with the note pitch shifters that determine which of these samples actually plays in response to that single incoming uh, F1 note right here. So it's the, the MIDI drum machine and the MIDI clip itself for the hat, it's just gonna be inputting an F1 every single time. And I want that incoming F1 note to play any one of these samples potentially. And by default, the way that this is set up, if I take the selector all the way down to the bottom, that incoming F1 note will only, it'll be translated, basically what's happening is F1 comes in and then this first note pitch shifter kicks it up by three octaves, so now it's F4. And then the second note pitch shifter uses this semitones chorus value to drop it down four octaves to, I'm sorry, let me back that up again. Let me explain this right. The first thing that happens when that F1 comes in is that this key tracker changes that F1 
to a C1 right here at note number 36. That's C1 in the series. Yeah, C1. So <laughs> this key tracker basically says no matter what note actually comes in, I want you to turn it into a C1 uh, effectively. And then after the note shifter, I'm sorry, after the key tracker, that C1 is pushed up three octaves to C4, and then that C4 is dropped with the semitones knob down by negative 48 semitones. And I'm sorry you can't see it right now, it's hidden by this modulator, these modulator dots, but this currently says negative 48. So F1 comes in, it's converted to C1, it's pushed up to C4, then it's dropped by this, down 48 semitones to C0. So what I'm effectively saying is when this selector knob is cranked all the way over to the left, anything that comes in plays C0 inside the multi-sample. That's all that's happening. So then I could crank the selector knob up by a couple values and now it might be playing something like F1 or E1. If I crank it up even more, like all the way to here, it's gonna be playing if my multi-sample spanned across to here, I'd probably be playing something like C4 at this position and so on. So again, you can see the details of that in that other video and play with it yourself and understand it. But I wanna start this set of samples all the way at the bottom so that whatever note comes in, it plays C0 inside the multi-sample. And then the note counter is going to modulate this semitone value at the very end up by one each time. So it's gonna crank it from negative 48 to negative 47 to negative 46 to negative 45, negative 44 and so on for 14 steps. And then it's gonna flip back around to the bottom at zero and drop this back to negative zero again. So what that'll make it do is walk through each one of these samples with every new hi-hat note that comes in. Now to make it work this way, to, to increment this by exactly one semitone each time, you have to choose an output scaling that it's called value. And the value for this modulator is set to exactly 1.0 and it's being assigned to the course knob, the semitones uh, selector over here. And then the final thing that you have to remember to do is you have to turn off the per voice setting for the note counter because you want it to, to um, respond to each new incoming MIDI note that isn't polyphonic. See, basically by default, the note counter is polyphonic and yet this is a monophonic string of notes coming in on the same exact MIDI note each time. And so we don't want it responding to and listening to other notes inside of the MIDI clip. If I leave this per voice checked, the note counter will actually respond to all these other notes that aren't part of the hat track. It'll respond to the kick, it'll respond to the snare, it'll respond to this, and so it won't creep upward the way I want. So this is a very important detail, is make sure for this use case that after you set it to value, you also turn off the per voice checkbox right here. And so now, as we play this loop, you're gonna watch these hats, and let me reset it so it will start on zero. And I wish it would update this visually to say zero when I clicked reset. It's really zero, but it's not gonna show you that until I start playing. Um, but you'll see it start on zero and just walk up one at a time and then go back to the beginning and walk up one at a time. So here we go. See how it's just walking? And you see these nice little dot indicators. And you can also see the dot indicators here, showing that the counter is doing its job. Okay, and we'll do the same thing. We'll look at the uh, kick real quick. So here's the kick. Let me reset it. Start this loop over at the beginning. Let's see how the kick, every new kick, just picks the next sample in the chain. Okay, so that's the whole technique in a nutshell. Thank you for staying with me. <laughs> uh, 
I could go into more about the, the note counter. I think if you understand what I've showed you for this one, then these other two possible values will make more sense and you'll be able to figure out how to use uh, the note counter for that. These two things are more appropriate for turning knobs, their full range from zero to 100% or from for the knobs that are bipolar and start at zero. Uh, this one here from negative one to one, that's for bipolar knobs and it'll go basically negative 100 through positive 100. So these are for knobs, this value thing with a very specific kind of value set here can help you manipulate uh, things that aren't knobs, like, like this kind of counter. So hopefully you've learned a few tricks. Um, and of course the advantage of doing this is now I can take this and make all kinds of variations of this one MIDI clip still using the sounds from the original loop and still having it uh, rotate through the different articulations of each drum and hi-hat uh, in a human way. And, you know, I couldn't do that if all I was working from was one loop. It would sound very robotic and machine-like to just keep looping the same loop over and over. This allows me to do some very humanistic things to my song. Uh, so, thank you for hanging with me. And as always, with all of my videos in this series, if you found this useful and you appreciate the time I put into it, please do me a solid and follow these two links in my uh, Bitwig handbook and throw me a follow on my SoundCloud and my Spotify. That would be a really great way to show appreciation. And I thank you very much if you, if you take the two seconds it would take to do that. All right. Bye-bye.